Welcome back, everyone. I'm talking to the YouTubers. People in the chat, I've been saying hi already, but that's, that's the drama. Uh, it's like a television show. Um, welcome back for part two of talking about the Code of Intellectual Conduct and kind of getting started on some ethical theory stuff. That's my main agenda for the two hours we got here tonight. Um, there's uh, a lot of stuff about the code like uh, that I want to talk about, like I was mentioning last time. Um, I'm going to try to not uh, belabor the rest of it too much here, um, but there are definitely some things that we probably should touch on um, before leaving the code behind. Um, but after we get done with the code, um, the topics I'd like to discuss that are kind of a start into ethical theory, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, emotions and the role that emotions can play in, um, in as a part of truth seeking and debate and this sort of rational activity of critical reasoning. Um, there's a question here about like, are emotions like a problem? Are they useful? How, just how should they be worked into that whole thing? Uh, I want to say some things about that. Um, I might talk just really briefly about religion in a kind of similar way um, as, as part of kind of in the theme of the Code of Intellectual Conduct of setting up kind of a foundation for how we'd like to have conversations. Um, and I know this is online, but there's still going to be ways for uh, you to interact with each other and to interact with me um, through message boards or through conversation with me or maybe even discussions that can happen in these video lectures if we can pull that off uh, to the extent that we can. Um, so I want to talk, I think those things are worth talking about. And then um, I'd like to talk about, I, I hope we can have time tonight to talk about two other um, sort of theoretical issues about ethics that I kind of think of as um, like gateway issues in the sense that they might involve uh, perspectives that uh, could say or, or lead us to be like, why should we even bother with critically reflecting on moral matters? So they're kind of like maybe um, the kinds of issues that depending on how they get sorted out might make a class like ours totally irrelevant. So I, I want to talk about that. One of them will have to do with uh, relativism and specifically moral relativism since this is an ethics class. Uh, and then also uh, egoism and uh, specifically psychological egoism. And um, that there's a special reading for that that's in, that's in the course uh, online uh, in the file section. I, I think I put it in the module too. Um, and it's optional. It's, it's one of the things I said you didn't have to read. But I want to touch on it just a little bit as a way to kind of get us going. Maybe we'll have time to get started on Mill. Um, fingers crossed. That'd be great. Um, I'm excited to get started on the on the the actual like main meat of this crash course in ethical theory. But I think there's a lot of little pieces that we can put into place still as a foundation that'll set us up. So that's the game. That's the overall game plan. Without further ado, let's uh, pull up the Code of Intellectual Conduct again here. Um, and we've got a few principles left to talk about. Some of these I'm going to skip or not say very much about. So if you're following along um, on your own copy of the code here, I'm on the top of page two, for those of you in the chat who can't see my screen right now. Um, I'm at the top of page two. Structural principle is really a principle that is just covering all the basics about logic. So um, if you, uh, you can take philosophy courses that teach formal and informal logic and that's kind of like the basic structure of thought and reasoning itself and there's a whole mess of standards and things that matter when it comes to just how we form arguments what are their structural features and what kinds of um, basic rational standards that we want to hold them accountable to um, for figuring out like what's a strong argument what's a weak argument and structural principles kind of a catch-all for all of that stuff um, so I'm not going to belabor it too much um, right now, but I might say, I might put some special attention here on the part that says a well-formed argument uh, would not use reasons that contradict each other, that contradict the conclusion, or that explicitly or implicitly assume the truth of the conclusion. That, that's, that phenomenon, sometimes we call it circular reasoning. Other times philosophers will call it question begging. Uh, unfortunately, begs the question is a phrase that most people misuse, uh, especially if you're like watching um, like uh, people on CNN or something, like on the news talking about like, oh, that, that begs the question. 
and they usually just mean it as like it raises the question, but its philosophical meaning is is really circular reasoning. That if I'm trying to justify a certain position or conclusion, and then I'm giving some arguments, if those arguments only make sense if my conclusion was true, then we've got a problem. That's that's kind of circular. I'm taking for granted the thing that I'm trying to prove. Um, the most blatant version of question begging is something like, this is true because it's true. You know, just like repeating the claim. Um, and that's a problem. Uh, those obvious versions are not going to convince anybody. Like, if I say, uh, kind of like a parent, like someone asks a parent, the kid asks the parent, like, why, 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 why? And eventually the parent just says, because I said so, or because, or something like that. That's always going to be unsatisfying to us. We recognize that that's not really providing a reason. It's not shouldering burden of proof in an argument, that kind of thing. But in ethics especially, there are um, trickier ways in which question begging can happen that aren't quite so obvious. That's why it says explicitly or implicitly assuming the truth of the conclusion. And those are things to be on guard against. I, I think to not turn this into a big tangent in the lecture, I'll just say this. Um, the general phenomenon of like preaching to the choir is a good thing to get you in the ballpark of trying to detect these more subtle versions of question begging. If, you're, if your arguments are only going to really sound convincing or be persuasive to people who already agree with your conclusion, then that's probably a bad sign. That doesn't work as a very good technical definition of question begging, um, but it would get you in the ballpark. And so um, a good way to think about what can you do to avoid question begging creeping into your own arguments is to think about making arguments that reach out to your opponent where they're at rather than kind of setting up shop and being like whenever you want to see the light and join us over here with the truth is cool kind of thing but like almost being like an evangelist or something like uh, going out to where they're at and trying to um, draw them over to your side to give reasons that they can understand that they can respect this sort of thing um, that also is not perfect as a technical definition, but it, again, kind of gets you in the ballpark here. Appealing to independent considerations or the kinds of things that your opponent already believes are the best substance to make arguments out of to try to convince someone of your position if you want to avoid question begging. Um, question begging kind of shows up in a in a in um, another sneaky way, and, and it's, it's one of these kinds of rational mistakes that even very sincere, careful, thoughtful people can make, like professional philosophers beg the question all the time uh, without intending to. Um, I think that's true because, or that, that tendency is there, and it's so pernicious because um, when we are convinced of a position, we tend to like look at the world through that lens, and that changes how we're seeing the other considerations that then we might think of as evidence. Um, you probably, uh, uh, maybe, maybe you've encountered the idea of confirmation bias before. Um, this idea that uh, if you hold a position, you're just psychologically, you have a tendency to naturally focus attention on the things that reinforce that belief rather than the things that might count against it. Um, and that's something we're always fighting against. Even, even well-trained, sincere, thoughtful philosophers can make that mistake. Um, the charge that someone's argument is question begging is something that you'll see very often in philosophical literature. Um, so we've got to keep an eye on that, especially with ethics, because uh, unfortunately ethics seems to be the kind of, uh, the, the territory of ethical claims I've noticed in my experience tends to be the kinds of claims that we hold ourselves least accountable for critically, that we tend to more take for granted or assume that other people are going to have the same kind of moral intuitions or feelings of conscience that move us. So it's it's very easy to beg the question. So trying to get in, imaginatively inside the head of your opponent is the best antidote to this, and that's really charity. So charity kind of helps with the structural principle. Okay, um, that's about all I want to say about that. Um, chat, how are we doing? Any questions about question begging? Cool? All right. Awesome. Okay, so 
to move on a little bit, I'm going to kind of skip relevance and sufficiency. Um, I probably I, I want to say some things about acceptability, but let's do a kind of quick version of this. Um, acceptability principle you might have noticed on the code has like the most text of any of them. Um, but really, you can kind of sum it up this way. Um, the acceptability principle is effectively trying to set up a filter for what gets into the conversation of the debate, like what things get put on the table to be considered. Um, and it's like putting a, a filter up that's going to like weed some things out from the contribution there to, to what gets, gets on the table. Um, so I don't like that idea um, because... Uh, I mean, well, and what is the acceptability principle mostly filtering out? Um, to kind of put it in brute terms, like, again, not the most technical terms, but for the sake of time here, it's trying to weed out basically crazy ideas um, or crazy perspectives. Things that are, like, really counterintuitive or strange or um, don't, fit, uh, don't fit into standards of rational justification that we already kind of are familiar with or commonly accept. Um, and I'm a little concerned about that for a number of reasons. I, this is the principle I think should just be cut from the code entirely. I think it should just be deleted. Um, I think it only makes sense if you're in like really practical circumstances, like say you're on a, a decision-making committee um, and you have to make decisions about what to believe, um, then uh, I think maybe thinking about the more out there proposals or something like that, maybe that's not appropriate. Maybe think about the more intuitive options first or the ones that seem like they have more going for them initially um, maybe that makes sense as a practical rule but especially if it comes to philosophical theorizing or for like a class like ours I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense and here's a few reasons one first argument I'd make the kind of standard of uh, 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 acceptability that's being offered there in the document weeds out a lot of the like famous philosophers of history and their theories like they don't pass <laughs> this standard of acceptability so it'd be like the code is saying we shouldn't even be considering them that raises a red flag for me but also for two more significant and substantial reasons um, one I think sometimes crazy ideas are right I think the history of philosophy kind of shows that um, an idea that first gets presented that everyone's like what actually ends up being the thing that's actually true and we wouldn't be able to figure that out if we didn't at least listen to it and take it seriously to evaluate. So that's one big argument I'd want to offer. But the other, the deeper one, for me at least, that convinces me that this wouldn't be appropriate is that even if I'm engaging with an opponent who I don't think is right and I don't think is probably going to be able to convince me, like their ideas are so beyond the pale of the arguments and reasons that I have to consider that I'm like, yeah, that's not going to happen. Like, um, the, the best personal example of this for me is uh, the philosopher Frederick Nietzsche, who I've actually spent a ton of time studying. Nietzsche is one of the, the sort of historical philosophers I'd almost consider myself a specialist in because of how much time I've spent on him. And I disagree with him about almost everything. I think he's totally wrong on many, many issues. Uh, he's got this kind of um, anti-egalitarian ethic where he thinks most of humanity is what he calls weak people and then there's a very small like elite crust of strong people um, or people who have like any value at all. Nietzsche thinks justice is crap. He thinks democracy is stupid. Um, he thinks the idea of universal human rights is a big lie. Like, I mean, it's just on and on and on. And I disagree with him about all these things. Um, and yet, I teach him in my classes. I, we, I, he's a part of the, my 101 curriculum. Um, I bring him in a little bit in my 102 class. Um, I spent hours and hours uh, poring over his texts and thinking and taking his arguments seriously. Um, and I don't think it's been a waste of time. Not because I think, oh, maybe Nietzsche is going to be right or something, but because even if I think he's wrong, and I've got pretty strong conviction that he's wrong, having to deal with his arguments and uh, kind of entertain the other side, right, kind of like in the spirit of charity, has taught me a lot more about what I believe and why I believe it. Like uh, using, again, Nietzsche just as an illustration here, if you have to face off against those kinds of opponents and those kinds of arguments, 
that are really uncommon or off the beaten path or extreme, um, they might provoke you to ask reflective questions that otherwise you might never ask. Um, for example, uh, just take kind of Nietzsche's anti-egalitarianism. So egalitarianism is a sort of ethical view that says that at least on a fundamental moral level, everyone is equal. So like it's not like some people have more um, moral rights than other people. It's not like some people are automatically and intrinsically more deserving of happiness or uh, have more of a right to life than other people or something like this. Um, egalitarianism is sort of like the sentiment of the founding fathers about how all everyone is created equal uh, under God kind of thing, right? Now, the founding fathers did not actually do that uh, across the board because of slavery, treatment of women, etc. Um, but that ideal, that moral ideal, is supposed to be across the board equal. And and even even though the founding fathers of America didn't really practice that principle or ideal perfectly, the philosophers that inspired them are really proposing it in that sort of way. Um, some of the philosophers that we're actually going to be studying here in the next week or so um, that are, are prior uh, to uh, the founding of America have those kinds of deep egalitarian beliefs, um, and that's what they really stand for. So Nietzsche is opposed to all that. But how often, um, I mean, egalitarianism at this point is almost something that we just kind of take for granted, like that um, that women have equal moral rights as men, for example. It'd be like to have anyone be like, well, well, whoa, whoa, wait a second, I'm not so sure about that, right? You don't have people challenging that belief very often, so it becomes easier for that. I mean, it still sometimes happens, but um, this isn't like a normal debate that you're having in all your classes, right? About like, is this really true or not? Um, but the lack of having like encounters of critical conversation with that kind of opponent can maybe make us not think about like why would that be true like what's really the foundation that supports that view questioning that doesn't always mean I'm really questioning it in the sense of like I'm not so sure it's true but questioning it as a way of wondering like okay I'm pretty confident this is true but why is it true what would be the basis for that confidence that's really solid so this is what's happened with me and Nietzsche over the years. Uh, I'm not really convinced that he's, I'm not really thinking he's going to convince me of any of these views, but he does have some arguments. He does have some objections. He has some challenges. And in trying to meet his concerns, I've been able to kind of, I've had, it's kind of like um, um, necessity is the mother of invention sort of thing. By having to face off against those arguments, I've had to think more deeply about why I believe what I believe. And I have a deeper relationship with my beliefs now than I did before. I think I might have said in the lectures before, like, uh, sometimes I think um, why we believe something is almost as important as what we believe. And I think this is another time where that's relevant with this acceptability principle. So I'm like, I think the crazy, pers the crazy perspectives have a valuable role to play in philosophical truth-seeking, in debate, and all this sort of stuff. Because um, sometimes they're right, and even if they're wrong, it can still be helpful. It can still be insightful. It can help us have a deeper relationship with the truth. So for my purposes uh, with this class, I would encourage us to maybe ignore the acceptability principle and give people charity, even if they have views that are kind of off the beaten path. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how much uh, discussion and interaction is going to happen on the forums uh, or in these uh, sessions with people attending, um, but that that is something I would encourage. I've got some crazy views too that I, like sometimes I'm that person in the conversation. So um, so yeah, so I I would want to be listened to. Maybe you sort of sympathize with that too. Maybe you're like sometimes like yeah I know what it's like to be the person who's offering a position that everyone else thinks of as totally counterintuitive and insane but and you would want to be listened to in that situation too so okay so that's acceptability um, let's keep this train moving how are we doing in the chat good any questions cool cool Awesome. Thanks for the feedback. I really appreciate it. It's good to not feel like I'm completely just talking into a box by myself.
<laughs> um, okay, so here we go. Uh, code, okay. So, um, yeah, relevance, sufficiency. I'll just say this couple, couple quick sentences about it. Um, it's really easy to get off track in a debate, and relevance is just reminding us, like, stay focused, stay on topic. Um, and there's certain things that are off, like off, um, off the beaten path that doesn't really maybe depend on what's going on with the actual debate. One of these is actually ad hominem attacks. So making personal attacks on people, that's wrong on ethical grounds as like abusive behavior, but it's also just not rational. Like attacking a person doesn't touch at all the ideas that they've played on the table. So in that way, it's irrelevant. Um... It's, on the one hand, unethical. It's not a good treatment for people. But on the other hand, it just doesn't help us get any closer to the truth. Um, it doesn't address any of the actual arguments that have been put on the table. Uh, unless the person has offered an argument from authority where they cite themselves as the authority. Then it's okay to talk about their character or their personality or, or things that are going on with their personal circumstances. But in most cases, we're not offering arguments that are based on authority they're based on just the ideas themselves. And a personal attack on us doesn't address any of that. So ad hominem, irrelevant. With sufficiency, oh, um, attack the, per the problem, not the person. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly the same sentiment, yeah. Um, there actually are all sorts of really interesting things I actually, ah, okay, I, I'm going to try to avoid too many tangents. But um, we can kind of confuse uh, people and ideas in both directions, right? Like, um, a personal attack doesn't at all address the issues. But also, attacking the issue, or attacking someone's ideas, is not a personal attack, but sometimes we can feel it that way. It can feel personal, especially if we're very much attached to those beliefs. So that's, that's a thing. Um, but also, we can sometimes think, because my ideas are solid, that therefore, I'm a good person, too, or I'm beyond personal reproach. And there's definitely ways in which even someone who's insincere or who has other sort of flaws, uh, intellectual virtue flaws, like rationalizing or being manipulative, not being concerned about truth-seeking or something like that, even they can make good arguments. Um, I don't know if I've said this before in a video, but I, I say this all the time. Um, it's it's a kind of a saying of mine I guess I'm fond of. Uh, so I like to say sometimes the most annoying thing about assholes is that sometimes they're right. Like sometimes people that we otherwise don't very much respect personally or we don't want to see ourselves on the same side as can still offer ideas that just make sense. And that can be really frustrating because you're like, I don't want to agree with you, but damn, yeah, that's that's right. That point's right. I have to accept that. You know, that's the thing. Um, so it's important to not confuse people and ideas generally. Um there are some special circumstances, and, and as a matter of our everyday social practices, um, it would sometimes be not prudent or sort of naive to not think about a person's character as somehow having an influence on their ideas. But when we're having a debate, like a truth-seeking debate, then we're really focused on testing ideas. That's the main thing. And, and again, if we're moving away from like, debate as a competition between people, but as a cooperative effort to get at the truth, then all the kind of personal stuff really doesn't matter. Um, in the syllabus, maybe you caught when I said, uh, and when I was talking about participation, that um, respect, I think for our purposes, needs to be a premise rather than a conclusion. Like, uh, I like sports a bit, and... Uh, I always hear athletes say, like, respect has to be earned kind of thing. But in the context of intellectual debate, I think that's totally wrong. That's the wrong direction to approach it from. I actually, I was just talking with um, one of my old students who uh, is probably the most successful student I've ever taught. They got into a crazy awesome uh, 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 undergraduate program. Um, and they were, they've been in there for one term now. And I talked on the, with them for a long time on the phone today because they're having, they're struggling with the kind of intellectual culture that's at that school. They were saying to me, they're like, I didn't really realize how good it was at Bellevue College, like how supportive the culture was, 
at the place that I'm at now, it's a really good school, but everyone is like competing all the time and they're not supporting each other as true seekers or any of this kind of stuff. And she was saying that it's just like, it's so hard for me to enjoy doing philosophy and do good work in that kind of environment. And in that environment that she's describing, it's an environment in which respect is a conclusion where people are like, you got to prove yourself before I'm really going to take you seriously or I'm going to offer you charity uh, or any, any of that kind of support. And that made me really sad. I, I was really bummed this afternoon to hear that she was having that experience and that the school, which is otherwise fantastic, has that kind of like toxic culture in it uh, as a part of their intellectual culture. It's too bad. Um, I think things are a lot better when trust is, or, um, when respect is just kind of given away uh, for free. It's like I'm gonna assume the best and um, and uh, kind of look for the best in your position, all that kind of stuff. Um, showing charity, I think that's the right way to go. My grad program actually, um, when I was in like a two-year master's program, and the second-year students, when I was a first year, kind of had some of this toxic stuff going on. And us first-year students, I remember us getting together and we we're just like, okay, we don't want to end up like that. Let's do something different. Um, and we were able to really do that. And I think what we I, I was, we had a really magical group uh, there. I'm very fond of all those people, and it made grad school just so enjoyable. And I think a big key, uh, the secret to the success that we had, was how we didn't we just gave away that respect. We're like, I'm in this with you. You know, going through this grad print thing together, it's hard, it's challenging. Um, we all are not sure whether we're able to make it. Uh, and let's just try to support each other as much as we can and, and build each other up and help support each other in the pro projects with criticism, um, not just with agreeing, but having that kind of attitude about it. So I think that's pretty important um, for us, for our purposes here too. Okay, that took longer than I thought it was. See, I, this is what always happens. Uh, um, so someone asked in the chat about whether I'd share the program that they're in. Um, and I'm kind of hesitating on it. I guess I don't like to badmouth other programs publicly on YouTube. Um, maybe I'll talk to you about that after this video is over or something like that. But um, I think I, I'll, I'll avoid that right now if that's all right. Um, okay. Um, rebuttal principle. Rebuttal is kind of just the follow-through on charity, if I'm going to sum it up quickly. Um, it's the follow-through on charity. So ideally... You're trying to build up your opponent as strong as possible, try to give them benefit of the doubt, use your intellectual imagination, try to come up with the most legitimate reasons for why they might uh, think that their position makes sense, even if you disagree with them. But then just being able to see the other side is only the half half the battle or half is so there's a follow through on this. If I write a paper and I'm like, here's my position, here's all my arguments, but I'm an open-minded person, so here's the other side, and here's all their arguments, and I present it, and then I just leave it, then I'm not really shouldering my burden of proof. I'm not being, I'm not fulfilling all of my intellectual responsibilities. If I'm able to look at the other side and see why it's compelling, then I need to take that seriously. Like, I need to show why their arguments aren't ultimately effective and defeat my position. If I'm going to retain my position in light of, of and in the context of their concerns, I better have some kind of response for that. I need to take their concerns seriously. Um, kind of like this idea of uh, a respect, like a, oh man, I skipped talking about that, I think, in the last video. Or maybe I didn't. Oh, I can't remember. People in the chat, do you remember me talking about a superficial notion of respect and a deeper notion of respect? Something I sometimes talk about in this lecture. Okay, yeah, I probably skipped it to try to cut things down a little bit. Um, there's, there's a kind of respect that's sort of like giving people a voice and, and listening to them um, and not like shutting them down or silencing them or something like that. Um, but a lot of times that can just be like pretty safe and we are not able to get critical. And that's pretty, the critical component is pretty important for truth-seeking. So in other sort of situations or, or social communities, maybe it does kind of make sense for people to just kind of like, just kind of go around the room and be like, so what did you think? Like, what was your experience? Cool, awesome. And you're not really commenting or evaluating on what people are sharing, just inviting them to share, and that's kind of it, and listening. 
Um, but for truth seeking purposes, the critical components got to get in there. We, we really we're wanting to test ideas and see what their merits are and if they have weaknesses and stuff like that. So um, having a space where we say to each other, like, I think you're wrong about that. And here's all the reasons why I think you're wrong. We got to be able to make some sort of space for that if we care about this whole truth seeking thing. So I don't think that's a threat to respect. Sometimes we might feel that it is that way or people when they do criticize each other's ideas they're not doing it in a respectful way but I think it is possible for criticism to also be respectful to be caring um, to be a gesture of concern for another person um, and this kinda goes in with that so rebuttal is where you actually try to take another person's ideas seriously enough that you recognize I've got an obligation to respond to those concerns I gotta deal with them or concede right um, rather than just being aware of my opponents or understanding them, um, it's kind of, uh, did, wouldn't it kind of feel to you a little weird, uh, like a kind of insincere, if you're in an argument or a debate with someone and you defend your position with an argument and they're like, I understand what you're saying, I still think you're wrong, and that was it. You'd be like, okay, uh, do you understand? <laughs> or like... Are you just dismissing all of my arguments or something? Or like, what's going on here? Um, and that's kind of where the rebuttal principle is is the follow-through on charity. And charity I was describing is sometimes like a gift, right? Kind of like a gesture of goodwill to your opponent. Um, but it's also a gift to yourself in terms of helping you test your ideas better. Um, and that's where the rubber meets the road. If I'm going to apply the ideas of my opponent to my situation, that, that all the action happens in thinking about what can I say to respond to that concern? Do I think it is a real concern? Is it based on false premises? Is it a, a, a problem, but maybe not a big problem? Maybe there are other considerations that overwhelm those concerns that still make my position the most rationally justifiable. Something like that has to be done um, to take them seriously. So that's rebuttal in a nutshell. Um, and then we've got uh, two more principles here right at the end. Um, the suspension of judgment and resolution. And again, I, I won't kind of belabor them in detail. The bottom line, I, if I was going to summarize them quickly, I'd say um, both of them are interested in, the, in what we're doing as we leave a debate. And it kind of boils down to trying to take the results of the debate seriously. So a lot, of, a lot of the way I'm describing a lot of the principles on the code is like sincerity, taking things seriously, respecting, th uh, and being sensitive to things. And that's definitely what's going on here. Um, both of those principles are trying to say um, it would be inappropriate to sort of uh, have a debate, kind of get to some sort of result, and then pretend like the debate never happened. So like, let's say we have a debate about something like maybe my core ethical views. Uh, the way I live my life or what I find meaningful in life and I give you my position and I give you all my arguments and then you raise some objections that are pretty serious and I'm not able to deal with them and then I'm just like okay cool thanks for the chat and then just go back to my life and keep living it the way that I was living it that'd be kinda insincere like I'm like man if I'm not able to justify or defend my ethical perspective then maybe I need to get a different one right it's sort of like if uh, fallibility principles telling us that coming into the debate, we should recognize that we might be wrong. It's sort of like coming out of the debate, your behavior should reflect the possibility that maybe you were just proven wrong, um, to kind of take the outcome seriously that way. That might mean changing a position. It also might mean retaining your position. It also might mean adopting an agnostic position. That's what the suspension of judgment thing is all about. Um, maybe one position has not shown itself to be uh, far and away the rationally superior option to its opponents. Maybe we're like stacking up arguments and reasons and stuff and these ones are kind of pretty close to each other. Then I shouldn't, I'm not really in a position to justify endorsing one of them over the other if that hasn't been shown with argument. Um, I think I mentioned in the last video that um, a lot of times what we're hoping for with the code is like, <laughs> nice comment, I'm gonna make my husband listen to this video. Um, so uh, we're hoping to get at the truth with these kinds of discussions. That's that's one of the mandates of the code itself. Is to try to find principles that help us get the best chance of getting at the truth. But more often than not, we can't get the truth. We can just maybe figure out what's the best option we've got right now, given all the things that we've been able to consider, what kind of makes the most sense, rationally speaking. 
What do we have the most rational justification for? And then at the end of the debate, we kind of need to take stock. So with the stuff that's been put down in that discussion, um, you know, where the where have the chips fallen? Is is one of the positions kind of shown itself to be like, man, that one's doing pretty good in terms of rational justification. Lots of positive reasons, not a lot of objections, not a lot of concerns um, to be worried about with it. Uh, so yeah, this one is better. Or the other opposing perspectives have been shown to be like deeply flawed, uh, that they've got counter arguments or objections that really defeated them. Um, then we should endorse that position. And if that's a position that you came into the debate with, cool, keep it. If it wasn't, maybe change, switch to that position. Um, and if it turns out that there's not a clear victor like that, then maybe the right thing to do is to say, I'm not in a position to make a firm commitment in my beliefs or values one direction versus another. And we got to keep looking at it. We got to keep talking about it, something like that. Now, I uh, respect what Edward Damer is doing with the code and putting these principles in the way that he's articulated them. And I think um, if we were certain types of beings, then these principles would make a lot of sense. And I definitely like the spirit of them. Like the idea that there's an obligation to take the results of a debate seriously, I think that's exactly right. Uh, we have to find a way to do that. But I think that there are other ways of doing it than what those two principles and what I just described, uh, how that could look. So the kind of picture that the, the code, those two principles on the code lay out is sort of like you have a debate, at the end of the debate, take stock of the results, and then readjust all of your beliefs and values accordingly to fit with what happened in the debate. If we were purely rational creatures, I'd be like, great, go for it. I, and, and, and in certain cases, and in certain people, maybe that kind of thing is possible. But I think on the most part, it's unreasonable as an expectation, especially if we're talking about things that really matter, like ethics, the kinds of things that we build our lives around, our livelihood, our whole lifestyle revolves around these kinds of claims. We can't just stop on a dime and turn and do something radically different. And, and, and in those rare cases in which we can, go for it, I think that's a great thing. Um, I've experienced some of those things personally in myself in my life where I saw an argument and I was like, oh, I should radically change something about my perspective and how I feel and think about things. And I was able to. And that was really cool. But that's not always what happens. Um, I think most of the time there's this other part of us. This I might call it just uh, if there's like the rational half and then there's like this psychological half. Um, and that doesn't move as fast. It's the kind of part of us that's ruled by habit. Um, and emotional dispositions, uh, kind of the way that we're programmed, our, our psyche, our personality. And those things can change, but they don't change as fast. Um, it's kind of like the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak kind of a sentiment, where it's like, I might rationally recognize this makes a lot of sense, but getting the rest of me on board is maybe a slower process of acclimation to that. And should we do that? Yeah, I think so. Um, if I recognize from the outcome of a debate, hey, this makes a lot more sense than doing something to try to align myself with what I believe to be true is authentic living. And if I don't do that, then I'm kind of doing something inauthentic. And that's a concern. That's a threat to the authenticity of, of my life and my choices. Um, so that's kind of where I stand on that. But I, I think that there's other creative ways here, and it can happen with patience and understanding. The other big concern I've got about these principles and how I'd want to tweak them a little bit here and make room for some other things is that um, I think it can be actually dangerous to treat ourselves and other people as if we are just these rational robots that can turn on a dime and reprogram ourselves. It's kind of like, um, I just gave you the argument, can't handle the truth, right? If you can't just like suddenly switch yourself over to that side, what's your problem? Are you are you attached to your beliefs? Are you got biases? Blah blah blah. It's just like, come on, like we're human beings, so we don't we don't work like this. And some compassion for and patience with each other and with ourselves, I think, is very appropriate. Um, there's a lot of ways in which the expectations about being fully rational can just be another weapon uh, for abuse, uh, something we beat each other over the head with. Or self-abuse, a uh, way we beat ourselves over over our own head. We can do that too. So um, those are things I'm sensitive to. So that's the code. Kind of uh, tried to finish it off as quick as possible. I wanted to keep it to a half hour. It's 40 minutes, but that's pretty close. 
uh, people in the chat, um, I wanted to uh, sort of make some space here available if anyone did have some opinions or thoughts. Certainly if you got some questions about anything on the code or stuff I've been discussing uh, that you'd like me to clarify. But if you also have any evaluations that you want to share, ideally I do this on like on campus with the whole classroom and hostage in front of me and I can be like, hey, do we have consensus in this room that we want to do things this way or how do we want to do them? Um, and being able to have some discussion about that. Can't do that online as easily, um, but there's seven of you. That's pretty awesome. Thanks for showing up. Um, do you have any suggestions about things you would want to change about the code if you're imagining this as like a contract you'd sign? Um, I think I might have shared the principle before about like uh, you can't say yes if you can't say no. And I want to give you an opportunity to say no. I don't want it to be the code be something like this is my classroom and these are the rules about how things are going to happen in my class. This is a proposal and a suggestion that I have. It's like I found, I think this kind of model works really well for trying to get at the truth and treat each other and ourselves ethically. Uh, do you agree? Do you want to do things this way? Are there other concerns that you have? I'd be very curious to know that. If you're watching this on YouTube later, send me an email about it or, or uh, talk about it in um, a journal entry down the road or something like that. But I'd, I'd, I'd like there to be some some conversation about that if you have some of your own opinions too. I, I've made some adjustments to the code and maybe you have some some adjustments you'd want to make too. Anyone in the chat have anything they, they'd like to ask about or contribute in terms of evaluating the code? Okay, that's fair. Oh, the code for the video. I haven't given that out yet. I'll do that. I'll do that a little bit later. But I'm talking about the code of intellectual conduct. How do you avoid a fake rebuttal? Mm. What do you mean by fake? Uh, uh, oh, so maybe more like false charity, um, or like someone who's, who's trying, to, or, or false fallibility principle, like someone who's making a show of being like, oh, I'm a critical thinker. I, I want to, I want to talk about this and have a critical discussion about it. And then when the objections start flying, they really don't seem to be engaged. They're dismissive or something like that. Um. That's a tough question. In general, it's a really tough question to ask, what do you do when someone else that you're having a conversation with isn't playing by these rules on the code of intellectual conduct? Um, so not just with this issue, but maybe any of them. Um, if someone is not running the game of cooperative truth seeking and is doing something more competitive or uh, manipulative or has ulterior motives or insincerity, all this kind of stuff, that can be really, really hard. It really does take two to tango. Um, in my experience, the magic really happens when both people are participating together around this. That, that's why I care about getting some consensus in a class about us kind of pledging to treat each other this way or trying our best to do that. Um, that this is, this is something that we're on the same page about. We share this vision. Um, generally, I would say I haven't found very much success with accusing people of violating things on the code directly. Like, shaming, I don't think gets you very far on it. Um, especially if the person is posturing like they're a critical thinker, then that's probably something they have worked into their identity. And to assault that directly is something that's really hard for someone to handle. If they're already not handling criticism, then they're definitely not going to be able to handle that criticism, I think. Um, I I generally, my, my general strategy, and this is just, you know, my best advice from my experience and... and it kind of fits with my temperament, so maybe this isn't something everyone would want to do, but to just answer the question openly and vulnerably, I'd say I generally try to stick to my own values. I don't, I, I try to stay acting in accordance with the code of intellectual conduct, even when my participant is not. 
Um, and I found in many cases just me repeatedly demonstrating that I'm not going to sink to a bullshit level of engagement in the debate can encourage someone who is maybe participating with some bullshit to kind of like come over to the side of sincerity. Um, calling them out on the carpet usually pushes them away. Um, but just kind of being steadfast in how you're you're still going to be, you're trying to think about it from their perspective. You're going to try to take them seriously. You're going to show them charity um, and take what they have to say as a, a threat that you have to respond to, to shoulder your burden of proof, to try to be really clear, to try to understand them, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that can sometimes get through after kind of, maybe not immediate reaction kind of thing, but uh, there's definitely some people I can think of in my life where, and even some students where um, I was like, uh-oh, this is probably not going to go well, but I'll just stick to my guns and like slowly over multiple conversations sometimes, um, they start operating in a different way too. So you can kind of seduce people into sincerity by just being it. I mean, um, take um, my student who went away to this school that's now in this toxic environment. I gave her the advice. I was like, she was going to the philosophy club there and it was really nasty. And I was like, you know, maybe tough it out just a little bit longer if that's if you can do it. I don't want you to hurt yourself kind of thing, but maybe tough it out because um, if you show yourself to be operating and playing by this different set of rules, like the code of intellectual conduct kind of stuff, which she's familiar with, um, then that's kind of like a breath of fresh air, especially in an in a environment that's already toxic. Like if you're just like so sick of getting beat up by people when trying to have critical debates about things and everyone's doing this competition thing, for someone to come along and be like, oh, I disagree with you, but I'm on your side in terms of trying to do this truth-seeking. I want to uh, do this in a cooperative kind of way. I mean, that's just like, oh, this is so much better. <laughs> and people can be drawn to that um, and want to participate with that. So in general, that's kind of my advice. Your particular question is a little tricky because it's got this kind of sneakiness to it. Um, there's sort of a person who's operating that way sort of has a tacit rest recognition of the importance of the sincere way of operating and they're kind of gaming it a little bit, right? Um, I definitely met people who have done this deliberately as a manipulative gesture to like posture like they're an open critical thinker type of person when really they're just being very manipulative and not really open to criticism or seeing the other side. Um, Sometimes it can be like that asshole situation of being like, yeah, maybe I can get some ideas out of this even if I'm not enjoying myself. Like maybe you have some insightful ideas to share and I'll just try to listen to that and do that as a part of my own true seeking thing, but I can't really see you as a cooperative partner in this. Um, oh, here's another quote or a, a chat. Oh, no, it disappeared. It was too long. Can you send it again? Oh, no. Oh, wait, no, here we go. Oh, I can see the history. Never mind. All right. Sorry about that. There is a way that they don't disappear. Okay. Um... Oh, when you know that they're a closed-minded person, know they're 100% wrong. Yeah. There's not a catch-all solution for these things. Um... I think you got a sense of my kind of general personality maybe in approaching this kind of stuff. Um, but there's a very distinct danger of my way of uh, approaching things. And I want to be kind of come clean and be upfront about that. Um, the big thing I'm always worried about in giving students advice about this kind of stuff is that I don't want to give advice that sets you up to enable abuse against you, which can often happen in those kinds of conversations, especially with people who are closed minded. Like being a, a sincere true seeker and, and continuing to operate with integrity, like sticking to your principles, doesn't mean that you need to stick around and just, you know, be in a conversation that is basically unproductive and meaningless opportunity for another person to abuse you verbally, uh, emotionally, or something like that. Uh, I don't think that that's appropriate. So sometimes sniffing out when that line has been crossed of like, is this really a good way for me to spend my time? You know, I I think there's ways that you can almost be a evangelist about a different way of operating, a different playing by different rules kind of thing. Like this code of intellectual conduct, I I really think of as like a kind of magical idea. Um, 
and a, a vision for how things can be better like how we can explore context of disagreement with each other in a way it doesn't have to be full of shit and toxic stuff and all that and I, I think that's pretty special and I I sometimes will tolerate a toxic conversation with someone just in the hopes of showing them a different way <laughs> you know of like um, by not blowing them off or ditching it you know maybe there's an opportunity for them to see something different and do and maybe do things differently themselves but that's a really dicey situation right because um, you might have to put up with some crap uh, to make that opportunity possible and if you give that to someone I mean that's a real special gift that's a way of like really being a servant to another person to put up with their bullshit for their own sake yeah lead by examples is the kind of thing I'm talking about yeah uh-huh oh, this message thing um. yeah yeah um, I, I think a lot of the principles on the code of intellectual conduct um, are also uh, they fit a lot with certain uh, ethical theories uh, especially one in particular we're going to study next week that um, emphasize respect for other people and and their uh, autonomy like their ability to be agents and have their own ideas and this sort of thing um, I think of uh, if you're playing by the rules on the code of intellectual conduct you're doing things that sometimes you're going to do the kind of behaviors that I've heard people talk about elsewhere as like radical empathy or active listening um, those those kinds of techniques or nonviolent communication um, and that those are really they can be very empowering um, when someone sees how you're listening really carefully and care about what they have to say and care enough about it to like maybe consider adopting it for themselves or to entertain it critically um, that can be that can be really empowering and certainly in the in a case of management um, many times you want your employees to be empowered you don't want them to just have to be requiring your micromanaging directives all the time right but it can also build a kind of trust um, in relationship too I think many times I think I mentioned before that like I think trust really helps debates go in a positive way like on the along the lines of the code of intellectual conduct and I maybe would say now playing by those rules in your interactions with people builds trust and builds relationship and builds intimacy I think too um, so that's um, that sort of connects with with um, what I hear you saying the the part about people being really closed-minded there's there's some other things here too I could talk all night about this too so I'm gonna have to cut myself off here at a certain point is this helpful so far Okay, cool. Um, cool. Oftentimes, uh, in my experience, um, closed-mindedness or this this kind of attitude is um, it's not an all-or-nothing thing. That's one thing I've observed about it. Uh, people might be really open-minded about some things and really closed-minded about other things, right? So it's not a kind of a your personality or your whole approach to truth is all the same way. And from moment to moment, it can really change, too. Um, and oftentimes, there's other issues going on that sometimes encourage that, I think. Um, sometimes it's because uh, the it's, it's a kind of defensiveness because people are expecting a competitive uh, intellectual wrestling match when it comes to a space of debate. Or that disagreement is something that threatens relationship, right? Like... Uh, Oh, if we don't agree on this, maybe we can't be friends anymore. Like people looking at, I'm not on Facebook anymore. Thank God. It's been ten years since I've, at least since I've logged in. But, um, like someone sees someone post something on their Facebook feed and then they unfriend them or something. It's because they like disagree with their political views or something like that. Um, that that kind of thing can be in the back of people's minds, and so they might be really on guard against a kind of space where we're going to have an open exploration of like all the reasons why we think each other are wrong kind of thing so um, that that space of open conversation can be really vulnerable 
and it could just be easier to block it out. And and a dogmatic attitude about this kind of stuff is a in in many ways I think saying no to a kind of relationship. It's uh, it's closing a door to a kind of intimacy. Um, at the same time, I have a lot of compassion for people when they um, make that choice under cer certain circumstances because it's it's a really tough kind of intimacy even among people who are otherwise close like friends and family members sometimes going to some of these topics getting to the some of these deeper issues and exploring those disagreements even with all the other trust and intimacy that you built up maybe that's a bridge too far um, it can be a, a whole new place of vulnerability and since we don't often go there I think uh, I mean, that's just my observation about our world today, at least the one that I encounter. Um, because we don't often go there, it can be an especially like squishy part of us that's like, ooh, you know, like if you're if there's a vulnerable spot spot in you that you're always sort of challenging, then it gets a little easier to do that. Um, but if uh, like uh, here's a really good example, and then maybe I'll, I'll I'll stop talking about this. I've talked too much about it maybe already. Um, in my undergraduate, I was mostly friends with theater majors. Uh, I weirdly enough, it just sort of happened this way. And theater majors are like really used to being vulnerable, right? Taking risks, doing improv, putting yourself out there, performance-wise, right? And personality. And I was always kind of this like introverted kid who was like, like I never. They always wanted to play, like get drunk and play improv games, and I was like, uh, no, I don't. I'm I'm just gonna watch or something, cause like. When it was my turn, I'd be like, uh, 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 like, I'd just freeze up and don't know what to say, don't know how to participate. They'd always give me shit about that. They're like, Tim, loosen up. Like, don't be so concerned about it. Like, be more, be vulnerable, you know? Like, do it. And then, then I'd start to have some philosophical conversations with them, and it'd be a totally different story, right? It's, that's the space that I'm more familiar being vulnerable in. And I was like, let's talk about this and this and this. And they're like, whoa, oh, uh, I don't know if I want to do that kind of thing or like steering the conversation away from that maybe or um, you know ducking out of the conversation um, early or, or something like that um, so in different different parts of us uh, different aspects of life we might be more or less comfortable in and I, I've sort of recognized that this is just in my own life personally it's rare that I'm able to find this space with people um, without explicitly creating it um, and maybe talking about it like we're talking about it in this class like hey check out this code let's you know do you want to do things this way kind of stuff I don't always bring up the code I don't like have a little pocket version of the code that I'm like hey you want to have a conversation read this first please kind of I don't do that but um, sometimes I will bring it up like if a conversation isn't kind of going in a positive productive or healthy way then I might be like, time out, you know, let's talk about this. That's sometimes something you can do with people who are closed-minded is just be like, okay, let's step aside from the issue itself for a second and let me just tell you, like, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I would like this conversation to be like. Here's what I'm hoping for from it. Um, I don't want it to look like this. Um, that can be another type of vulnerable thing, but I've, I've had su some success sometimes just being explicit about that um, and inviting someone into participating that way, but... You know, your mileage is going to vary. And from context to context, especially in a work environment, there's all sorts of other emotional and social noise going on. Um, yeah, it can be tough. Um, yeah, so I think it's it's kind of a special space. It's a And I don't always get to practice it. Being a philosopher, I get to practice it a little bit more. But I remember coming right out of college, graduating with an undergraduate degree in philosophy, and... Um, having my advisors screw up my applications for grad school so I had a year off um, no don't get me started on that um, they didn't turn their rec letters in on time I was so frustrated with them but I was like just working a job and I didn't have philosophy classes and it was like qu quitting heroin cold turkey I was like so used to being able to have the opportunity to have these deep discussions with people like on readings that we mutually read on a daily basis and now it's like trying to st strike up a deep conversation with people is pretty tough. Um, it's hard to find the opportunities for that. Um, so I have understanding about that, and I, I think it's good to have understanding with people about that. Uh, I think we too often moralize the open-minded, closed-minded thing in people and get really judgmental of people that we deem to be closed-minded. Um, but all of us can need some help with that. 
Um, and it's something you can grow into too. I don't think that there's just like cool people and assholes or something like that. There's, there's, um, we're more flexible. We're more plastic than that. And sometimes all we need is to be given the opportunity and we can turn over a new leaf on some stuff. But, okay, so I've talked quite a lot about that. Uh, if you want to talk more, that's definitely something outside of class. We could, we could talk about um, phone calls, emails, all that good stuff. But I do want to get into some ethical theory stuff here. Um, maybe I'm going to take just a really quick, like, two-minute break, grab some more water, um, and then I'll talk about um, relativism and egoism. Sound good? Cool. All right, I'll pause this video and then we'll come back. All right. Um, so, these two issues about relativism and egoism are, like I call these, gate issues. And the, the kind of, the looming stakes here that are involved in these debates is that maybe a uh, truth-seeking pursuit of ethics and morality is a big waste of time. It's not worth it. Um, either that there isn't any truth here, or the thing that's even being proposed is impossible for different reasons. Um, that's kind of what's at stake here. So the, the threat's going to be different between the two of them, though, between relativism and egoism. Um, and I'm a little self-conscious, actually, about giving this mini-lecture about relativism. And the reason is that um, I've actually had many instructors who kind of, uh, philosophy instructors, who kind of show up on the first day of class and are, like, trying to beat all the relativism out of their students. They're like, relativism is stupid. It's non-starter. It's got fatal objections to it. Don't even think about it. Like, just totally disabuse yourself of that notion. Um, forget about those intuitions. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, now we can get down to work. And part of the reason, I mean, I can understand why sometimes they're motivated to do this, and it's because um, if relativism is right, then all rational debate's a big waste of time. So doing any kind of truth-seeking is pointless. And since philosophy is all about that, and the whole field is sort of based on that, um, it's kind of, rel relativism would be a non-starter. Now, uh, I kind of don't like that. And it's not because I'm a fan of relativism. I actually disagree, I disagree with relativism. I'm, I'm against relativism, and for a lot of the traditional reasons. But I don't think it's good to just, like, um, sort of dismiss it out of hand and not try to understand what's behind it. Um, because I think it is a legitimate philosophical position. It's at least an option that we have to take seriously um, rather than just kind of dismiss out of hand. Uh, sometimes truth doesn't fit with what we want it to be um, or what would be productive for us. So um, it, would, it would be a shame if it turned out that the entire field of philosophy was a waste of time. But if we're going to be sincere truth seekers, we've got to take that into consideration and as an option. So... Um, I want I want to kind of um, I am bringing up relativism in this same kind of way, right? That like this might be one of the initial barriers that might make some of the readings we're going to take a look at, or just the whole sort of a philosophical approach to truth seeking critically about morality, you might be skeptical of. Um, I very often have students that have relativistic sympathies or full on commitments. They're like, "Yep, that's my position. That's my perspective." And, um, and there's parts of me that are sympathetic with it as well. I, I've seen definitely some motivations towards relativism and arguments towards relativism that I can disagree with. I don't think they're really effective arguments to justify relativism, but I, I definitely am sympathetic with them. I don't think that they're bad concerns. I just don't think that they justify relativism. So I'm going to try to be charitable toward it while still not um, pulling the punches on the kinds of objections that it has to square off against. Um, I'm going to do that in one second here. So I'm actually going to um, bring up a little whiteboard thing. And actually, I might be able to share it here with the whole chat uh, who's live as well. Let's, uh, let's, do, let's do this. Application window. Oh, come on. There's more applications. Where are my other applications? Like this one. There it is. Okay. So now I'm sharing this Microsoft Paint window. Can everyone see this? 
Sweet. Awesome. Wonderful. All right, so I'm going to kind of lay this out a little bit. Um, I'm going to hold on to the microphone. There we go. Um, there's kind of a classical debate here. So let's go realism. Realism is the kind of position that a lot of philosophers adopt that's in competition with relativism, and it holds to two theses. Um, truth, this is a debate about truth um, and the nature of truth. And realists say truth is stance independent. And what do I mean by that? I mean, let's make that, there we go. Truth is stance independent. I mean that it doesn't matter what subjective position we occupy, what our experience has been, what our feelings are, what our beliefs are, what our values are. None of those things affect what is true. Truth is truth. The world is how it is. It doesn't matter what we know about it or what we think about it, or what we believe about it. It is the way that it is. Um, the world, like uh, a lot of us have pretty strong realist intuitions when it comes to the descriptive world or the physical world, like the world of natural science. That like there's facts out there. Like um, I don't know if I used this example before, the uh, aliens on Alpha Centauri that like Nicolas Cage movies. Like if I make that claim, there are aliens on Alpha Centauri that like Nicolas Cage movies. There, we generally think there's a fact about that. It is either true or false. I don't know whether it's true or false, but there is a fact about it. Like there is a truth about how the world is that fits that description or doesn't. And whether it fits that description or not doesn't depend on anything about what I believe or what I experience or what I perceive or anything like that. To the realist, all the stuff that's going on with me subjectively might be helpful for me knowing the truth. But in terms of just the truth itself on its own, it doesn't care about me. It is stance independent. Okay, and because the truth is stance independent, there's also um, the commitment there is universal objective truth. The realist believes this. They believe that there is objective universal truth because it's sort of independent of us. So kind of imagine, I'm going to do some really terrible drawing now. Um, let's see. Uh, is this, yeah, hey. Here's some people. Here's two people. And they might have like different ideas, right? They have different beliefs about what is true. They don't see eye to eye about things. But the realist is sort of thinking there's the truth. Well, I cannot spell truth. Um, the truth that is sort of, uh, oops, I promise I didn't have any beers before this lecture. Uh, the truth is sort of out here independent of people's perspectives or opinions or sort of what's going on in their subjective stance, the position from which they view the world and encounter it and have opinions about it. To the realist, truth is out here. It's like the common public playing field that we all occupy. Um, and this could be true whether we're talking about descriptive claims about reality, like what science studies, or potentially in the moral realm that there's maybe our values or what cultures set up as values that are options for how we might think about morality or what we think is good and bad and right and wrong or how we feel about justice or something like that. But the moral realist says whatever is actually what is good and bad and right and wrong is set in a way that has nothing to do with our feelings or our thoughts or our experiences. The truth of what is really just, capital T truth, doesn't depend on us. That's what the moral realist believes. And what this allows the realist to sort of say, theoretically, is that it's possible for our beliefs to be wrong because they don't match up with what the truth is. Now this is different for relativism. So let's start talking about relativism now. Uh, chat room, um, really quickly. Any questions about how things are going with my description of realism so far?
Cool. Awesome. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for the feedback. Okay, so we've got, um, in opposition to realism, we've got, oh, come on. There we go. Uh, relativism. And actually, I wanted to make that underlined. There we go. Relativism. And the relativist, as you might imagine, um, thinks there is no universal objective truth. Man, what is my problem with typing tonight? There, uh, there is no uh, universal objective truth. Truth is relative um, because they think truth is something stance dependent. I think I can't talk and type at the same time. There we go. So those are the theses that define relativism. Um, truth is stance dependent. That means it does depend on our subjectivity, and more particularly here, and we should be particular about this. We, we should actually get specific about this for stuff we'll do later next week. Um, the, the thing that the relativist, the, the thing about our stance or our perspective that the relativist ties to truth is really just our beliefs directly. So what our beliefs um, and values are, uh, those are the things that make our truth. So for the relativist, there is none of this stuff. There isn't some stance independent truth out there. That there are only truths for people. And I kind of want to do, uh, where is this? Can I draw? Oh, there, it's not letting me do that. Um, I wanted to make a kind of weird dotted line here, but I can do this. Oh, no, I'll do it. Um, here we go. Yeah, here we go. So there's like a truth for this person. And then there's like uh, a truth for this person. And their truth is basically defined by their beliefs and values. So what might be true for this person is not what's true for this person if they have different beliefs. Um, if this person has, you know, this is a logical symbol for, oops, the logical symbol for not. So they might say, not, I don't have that belief. And I actually think that value is not correct either. Then these people don't really have a disagreement according to relativism, because uh, the only claims that they're making about is about what's true for them. So these are kind of bubbles. They're, they're sort of truth is quarantined within each person to themselves. So if truth, if a truth for a person depends on what they believe, and people believe different things, then that means there is no universal objective truth out there. There isn't this stance independent thing going on. That could be the common benchmark or the common uh, reference point for whether we've done things right or wrong. That just doesn't happen under relativism. And maybe at this point you can start to anticipate why philosophers who are otherwise committed to truth seeking would have a problem with the relativist way of talking about truth. Because this way of talking about truth, or to see truth as operating in this sort of way, makes it impossible to be wrong. There's no way to be wrong. If you change your beliefs, you've just changed your truth. If you end up disagreeing with your past self, you're actually not saying that your past self is wrong. You're just now in a different truth. You know, there was the truth of your previous self, and now there's the truth of your current self. That's it. So there's no progress that we're making. Where we, you can never learn things under relativism. You're just changing your truth. You're not growing in it, or you're not developing it, or eliminating mistakes, or something like that. And that's really disturbing if you have intuitions that we can be wrong, right? Like, and I, I don't want to go after too much of the like low-hanging fruit here because there are definitely some some pretty easy potential counterexamples like. Under moral relativism, you couldn't say that the Holocaust was wrong and that the Nazis were wrong. You just have to say, well, that was their truth, that it was right. You know, it's not my truth, because I don't, I don't think that the Holocaust was right. I find it an act of moral bar barbarism. That's my truth. But for their truth, you know, that's their truth. Who am I to judge them? You know, I only know about my truth. That's that kind of who are you to say what my truth is kind of sentiment is very classic relativism right there that you are sort of the final arbiter on what is true for you. 
that's kind of how relativism works. Um, so there's no opportunity here for cross-contextual criticism, for like someone to to make an argument about what someone else's perspective has going on, because all they can really do is just push their ideas onto other people and have them join them in their truth. There isn't the idea of maybe your beliefs don't match up with how things actually are, and so there's a mistake to be avoided or something like that. Okay, so um, that's what makes relativism a little disturbing to people, and why why a lot of philosophers are opposed to it, and also why. Um, there would be a, a significant problem for our purposes um, if uh, relativism was true. Because what we're going to do in this class is really look at people's proposals for what is objectively true. What is justice truly? What do we owe to each other and to ourselves ethically? Um, what is better and worse? What is good and bad? You know, those are those are questions that these different philosophers are going to be trying to answer. And they're not just reporting on their personal belief here or what is their truth or something like that. They're really intending for these things to be applied universally and objectively. Um, and they're all kind of operating under the assumption that um, there is something here to get right or wrong, that I could have false beliefs, I could have false values, I could have false principles, and let's make sure they're right. That's something that is going to be ubiquitous here. So. I always like to say this. If if you've got if you heard relativism, you're like, no, that's how I think things are. Like I've got pretty deep sympathies with the relativistic perspective um, that everyone has their own truth and and there isn't this universal sort of thing. Um, I I don't want you to. I, I'm kind of wanting to talk about it now so that you're not uh, kind of taking the class and feeling like the curriculum is like deeply biased against your philosophical perspective. I mean, I, I wanted to kind of explain that there's a reason. I mean, there isn't a lot of philosophy to do if relativism is correct. Um, another thing that probably is definitely worth mentioning here um, is that there's a difference in the the what we mean by relativism when we're talking in a philosophical mode or about ethics versus in, um, say, uh, um, sociology. Has, has anyone in the chat, have you taken any sociology classes? No? Mm. I mean, sociologists are trying to study culture, right? Um, <laughs> uh, and um, they're really concerned about, if you're trying to like study a foreign culture, you can't infect your investigation by making assumptions about what's going to be true in that culture based on what you're used to in your culture. So uh, cultural relativism is actually kind of like a, a research axiom of sociology. Um, you, if you want to understand a foreign culture for just like what it is and what's going on in it, then yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe you've heard of this idea. Maybe this will sound familiar for you, Carol. Um, if you're trying to understand another culture, you can't assume that the meaning that they're going to put to things or to certain behaviors or gestures or words or you know that kind of stuff is going to be the same as it is in your culture. In other words, you can't import and project your culture onto the thing you're trying to study. That's because that that's a totally fine principle. That kind of endorsement of relativism theoretically by a sociologist totally appropriate. And that's because their job is to try to figure out just what do people believe? What is their perspective? Uh, it's just this kind of descriptive science. It's, 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 a, it's a scientific project that they're up to. When we're doing this kind of truth-seeking stuff in philosophy, especially in ethics, we're not just trying to understand what other people's perspectives are, but we're trying to evaluate them. Um, we're trying to figure out, is that what is really the best thing we ought to think? Is that the perspective we should adopt? Are we justified in this rationally? And that's a different kind of project than just trying to understand a person's position. To evaluate it is something different. And a lot of sociologists, I think, are very motivated by ethical concerns. Like most sociologists I've talked about, they got into the field because they're sensitive about moral problems um, that happen when we don't understand our, our culture very well or we don't understand other cultures very well and sort of uh, the edification about sociological realities has an ethical imperative backing it up. 
Um, so most of them, I, I think, are motivated that way and think that there are certain ethical things that fall out of, uh, of their research. But they aren't ethicists. Sociologists, are. it's not their job as sociologists to evaluate the cultures that they're studying. They're just trying to understand them. They're not trying to evaluate them. That's a different project. And in philosophy, that's kind of what we're doing. We're looking at all the different kinds of options and perspectives that are out there, including the ones that get embodied in cultures, and trying to be critical thinkers about it. Um, kind of uh, another, like, kind of a snippy argument. I don't. I hope this doesn't sound too too snippy. But one another argument I sometimes like to offer against relativism is that. You know, if relativism, if say cultural relativism was true, because there's this kind of individual relativism with truth for individual people, but there's also another variation of relativism called cultural relativism, where uh, the truth for a people is set by the beliefs and practices of their culture or their society. So instead of individual people, now we're talking like a bunch of people uh, in a community together. Oh, I cut off for five seconds. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I can repeat. Um, so uh, there's the kind of version. Can you hear me now? Okay, awesome. There's a version of relativism that um, is sort of individualistic. That's the way I was describing it in that diagram on paint that I just did, where it's like every individual person has their own individual truth based on their individual beliefs. But you can also run a version of relativism that puts it in a community. So you, it's called cultural relativism. So instead of um, the beliefs of a single person setting the truth for them, it's the beliefs of a people in a society or in a culture in a culture that set the truth for them. So if we're thinking in the context of moral judgments here, it would be like the practices of a culture or a society sort of set what is morally right for people in that society to do. Like objectively, or not objectively, but um, not just what do they believe, but this is the truth for them too. Um, and uh, one little quick argument I sometimes like to offer against cultural relativism is that if cultural relativism was really true, then you couldn't criticize American culture. And my guess is you probably have some criticisms of American culture. Like there's some things about America's culture that are like problematic, let's say. <laughs> or like troublesome or concerning, whether that's like materialism, um, whether it's, I mean, there is a lot of institutional racism and inequality going on in American culture. Um, so there, there, you, you might have some criticisms of, of what's going on. Capitalism, maybe you want to criticize. Uh, it's got some problematic features to it. Um, lot, there's lots of stuff to criticize with America. America's not perfect, I think. But if you agree with that, if you think American culture is not perfect, there's mistakes that it's making, it's getting things wrong, then you can't be a relativist. Relativism wouldn't give you any theoretical room for that because it's not possible to be wrong under relativism. Whatever choice is made, that's the truth. And so that's, if we think that there's some truth seeking to do, we want to hold our beliefs critically accountable to standards, um, relativism just doesn't allow for any of that. Um, there's some concerns about relativism. The, the most classic arguments against it uh, involve things like it's self-defeating. Like relativism has to kind of say there's no objective universal truth except for that one, the one I just said where relativism is true. So there's that kind of concern about it. Um, what is a relativist going to say about the truth for people who reject relativism? That's a classic logical paradox for it that it can't really resolve very well. Um, I really like a modern updated version of that kind of argument by a philosopher named Thomas Nagel who says that as soon as the relativist starts trying to defend their position, they're inevitably going to make realist claims. You can't defend relativism with more relativistic claims. You're always going to make some kind of objective statement for what are your reasons for why you think relativism is a justified position. So that's a problem. So we can't, t Nagel's sort of point is to say, we can't escape realist thinking. That's just the game that we're playing in, and we just have to play it as responsibly as we can. The idea of opting out, like, oh, I'm not going to make objective truth claims anymore. 
is not actually possible. And even avoiding universal claims is not possible, according to Nagel. I kind of am partial to that argument. Um, but there's also another one that I want to share. But actually, there's a message that just showed up in the chat. Um, ah, <laughs> well, there's... Uh, so, um, someone in the chat here, for those of you watching on YouTube, saying that um, they moved here and think that uh, American culture's actually got a lot of cool things going on. And I, I actually agree with you. I've got a lot of criticisms for American culture, but I think there are some things that um, are really special about it and that still kind of give me hope about it. Um, just as a, a little anecdotal case um, for myself, um, one of one of my favorite uh, Buddhists is Chogyam Trungpa. I might have mentioned him in a video last this last week. Um, I might have actually done that. Maybe if I mentioned, uh, did I talk about um, the purpose of a spiritual friend is to insult you? Does that ring any bells? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Trungpa. So this guy, he was part of the Tibetan diaspora when China invaded. Um, went across the mountains, lots of people died, was rescued, came over to Britain and then over to America and started teaching Americans Buddhism, basically, Tibetan Buddhism. And to a traditional Buddhist, America looks like just hell, hell on earth for, for Buddhist principles. It doesn't really go very well. But Trungpa um, thought that his belief was that America could be could become this kind of mythical place Shangri-La like this sort of like Buddhist this ideal Buddhist state on earth he thought that there was something kind of magical and special in America I don't know exactly what he saw in it um, I have some suspicions about what he thought we're sort of in a special position for but I definitely have a lot of things about American culture that I'm hopeful about and that's why I kind of brought up Trungpa um, I think Trungpa didn't he, he was very traditional Buddhist in many ways. I don't think he was endorsing a lot of American culture, but he saw a kind of potential in it. He saw this like seed of something special that could be nurtured and, and blossomed into something. And I think that's kind of how I describe my attitude about uh, my, my, my sort of evaluation of American culture. You know, we forget that we're still so young. Like in terms of nations in history, America's like in its maybe middle school years, <laughs> maybe not even in high school. Um, there's still, the, the America was called, when it was first created, the Great Experiment by people in Europe. And they're kind of skeptical, like that this was going to work, this kind of like melting pot thing of different cultures and, and ethnicities and things like that, different perspectives with strong democracy. And I kind of think, uh, especially with current affairs nowadays, like, Jury's still kind of out on that <laughs> experiment and whether it's going to be a successful one or not. But I'm still very hopeful and optimistic about it, too. And, and so definitely I didn't want to just, like, shit all over American culture. But my hope for it is definitely premised on some things getting corrected and some things being, being solved and fixed because um, I definitely think there's some deep problems. Someone else asked me why I like Trungpa so much. Um, I like him... I don't want to get on a big tangent here, but I do want to entertain your question and give you something for it. Um, one of Trungpa's nicknames is the Crazy Wisdom Guru, because he was kind of a part of a hippie movement in the 60s and 70s, and um, and he, he is definitely out there. And I, I think he actually, in some ways, as a person and as a Buddhist, he ultimately failed. Uh, he kind of became an alcoholic, and uh, some question about how his treatment of women and stuff, too. But... Um, so there's, he's a definitely a problematic kind of figure in my mind. Um, but he, listening to his lectures and his writings, um, he has this amazing ability, this uncanny ability to, in, in the, his sort of analysis of things or the way he explains how he thinks about something, he has a way of just like cutting to the core issue, like cutting past all the bullshit. Um, in the Buddhist tradition... There's this idea of a Vajra blade. Um, it's this kind of insight or wisdom that cuts through uh, all, of, all of our karmic bullshit like a, a hot knife through butter. Like sometimes we really like wrestle with our baggage and our failings and, and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and, and every once in a while, like sometimes we have to like work on that stuff slowly, like 
dehabitualize bad habits. But every once in a while, like insight can just like shine right through it and like just cut us to our core. And Trungpa is really good about that. Um, I definitely think he's a philosopher. It sounds like you've got some familiarity with him. You said uh, you wouldn't call him a traditional Buddhist. Um, in many ways, that's true. And in many ways, I think he is a traditional Buddhist too. Um, he definitely does some weird experimental stuff. Uh, he he actually breaks his monk vows um, as a part of sort of assimilating into the West and into Western culture to try to reach it. Um, but at the same time, he does like uh, he forces his uh, the his students and people who showed up on his little, little farm. Um, uh, he forced them to like really do some super traditional Buddhist practice, and they're kind of like are all these hippies who are like not really wanting to do super disciplined practice kind of stuff. And he was big on that. Um, and a lot of his uh, doctrinal beliefs, like he he sometimes talks in like the crazy way um, and swears and does all this weird stuff um, that we wouldn't expect out of a like traditional Buddhist monk. But when you really look at the ideas that he has and, and the sort of Buddhist theory that he has or philosophy that he has, yeah, I think it is very uh, traditional stuff. Um, he also is innovative. Uh, he had a uh, – now I'm just giving a big lecture about Trungpa. But if you want to talk more about this, we can do that sometime. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, please instead, uh, do anything. Da, da, do, but Catholic. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, I don't know if I told everyone, but I'm, I identify about equal parts Lutheran and Buddhist. I went to a Catholic high school, and well, that's kind of weird um, to be a Lutheran in a Catholic high school. But uh, I definitely think there's some ways in which Christianity and Buddhism uh, have something to learn from each other, and how uh, they can like fit together. Yeah. Um, but again, I don't want to get on a big tangent about that. Um, might get into a little Buddhism a little bit later, because it's, it's definitely got some cool ideas to add to the mix about how we approach ethics theoretically. But... Anyway, let's uh, let's keep going. So, um, one last thing about relativism, in terms of like charitable arguments on its behalf, I I think um, well for one thing, I'm kind of talking about relativism early on here in this kind of first week, but there actually is a unit that we're going to do later on in the quarter, the international business uh, unit, in which this is going to reemerge, because uh, so let's switch into more practical mode here. You can probably anticipate some moral difficulties surrounding multinational corporations, uh, corporations that exist and have uh, offices or uh, factories or different um, installations in different countries, in different cultures. And there's a question, if we're talking about general rules for business ethics, should a multinational corporation have the same ethical standards across the board for all of their branches, no matter what cultures are they in? Or, um, does it should it be sort of playing by different rules based on what country it is it's in? Should it be more like a cultural relativist about what is the proper way for the business to operate? Um, should there be a universal standard about this or not? Should it be relativistic? That's a really difficult puzzling problem, and relativism comes back as like maybe a way to solve that. Maybe that's a that's a way to negotiate uh, having to interface um, different parts of your company. Um, so those those are there's going to be some some concerns. We're going to come revisit relativism later in the quarter um, and look at some of the arguments on its behalf charitably. There, there's also some concerns that I have a lot of respect for. I think this motivates a lot of the French uh, postmodern philosophers, which have a tendency toward relativism, that they're really concerned about our bias uh, about how we approach trying to investigate things as realists. So if we think there is an objective universal truth, it's still a whole nother thing whether we know what that is or not. And as we try to pursue that objective universal truth, are we really just mistaking something that's contingent about our circumstances or our perspective um, for what's universal when it's really not? Um, and that maybe the safest, most prudent thing to do as thinkers is to adopt the kind of relativistic approach rather than continuing to believe that there is an objective universal truth out there. I mean, I don't agree with that argument. Charitably, though, I can kind of respect it because uh, as a realist, as someone who believes there is objective universal truth, I would think that we should be very concerned about bias and trying to sniff it out because um, it'll hijack our efforts at truth-seeking. 
it'll get us away from the truth. It'll distort the truth. Um, and that's something we should definitely have on our radar. I just don't think relativism really solves the problem. It's kind of like curing the disease by killing the patient, <laughs> right? If we're concerned about mistaking what is contingent for what is universal, um, just saying everything is contingent doesn't really solve any of those problems. Um, we're still going to just do our thing then, and then other people do their thing, and we don't really resolve any disagreement or get any better idea of what choices we should be making about what we ought to believe. That doesn't really help in any of that stuff. Um, but another argument to, to give some charity here to relativism that I've heard many times from people that I think adopt relativism for very sincere reasons um, rather than insincere ones is a value on tolerance. And I think sometimes relativism can look attractive. Let's let me actually bring up that little picture again here. Um, so let's get over to this chair. Um, so you know, if we've got these quarantined bubbles of truth for people under relativism, what that stops is any idea of cross-contextual criticism or some universal standard that we can measure each other to or something like that. So that might look like tolerance. It's like, no, man, you, it's your, that's your truth. Cool. I got my truth. You got your truth. Live and let live kind of thing. All right? We can tolerate disagreement. We don't have to try to resolve this and figure out who's really right or something like that. So um, that I think sometimes if you value tolerance and you think that's an important value, relativism might look more attractive. And, and realism might look dangerous if you're worried about like dogmatism. If someone believes that their values are objective and universal, then that might be a problem for like a, a sort of a tendency into dogmatism, closed-mindedness, that kind of thing, right? Um, and so maybe relativism looks safer because it's not allowing. It's saying like it's just impossible in principle to ever make judgments about other people or other cultures or things like that. You're just not in a position to do that. Um, now, my rebuttal to this uh, concern is, one, I think tolerance is a great value. And so my problem with the argument is not that tolerance isn't an important value. My concern is that uh, relativism is not the best uh, position with which to hold the value of tolerance in a robust way. Um, and I've, I've got a kind of a longer version of presenting this, but for the sake of time, I can kind of boil it down, I think, and get the basic idea here. Um, Imagine a culture that's not tolerant, and that's woven into their culture itself. And we can definitely imagine intolerant cultures. Um, under relativism, we can't say that they're doing something wrong. We just have to say, well, that's their truth. We value tolerance, because so that's our culture. That's our liberal, Western, individualistic American culture, that we, we value tolerance. Um, we value pluralism, diversity, that sort of thing. But this culture, that's not the game they're playing. That's not their culture. That's not their society. It's not their values. Who are we to say what's right for them kind of stuff? That's the, that's the kind of relativist line. So you can't actually ever criticize intolerance when it's happening. So what does it really mean to value tolerance under that kind of circumstance? Um, as someone who does think that tolerance is an important ethical value, uh, I don't think relativism allows me to sincerely hold it and to protect its legitimacy and sort of the need for it. I think the much better thing to do is to just say, if you value tolerance, make tolerance an objective universal moral value. I mean, that's what you're committed to. Now just you got to shoulder the burden of proof to prove that that's true, um, that it really is a universal value, even if there are certain cultures or people who think it doesn't matter or it's wrong to do that or something like that. What could you say? that could help to them to see that this is the best position, that it is the most reasonable position, it's got the most justification to it. Um, I think sometimes uh, people are relativists, especially about morality, like you could be a moral relativist and not a relativist about other things. Like you'd be a realist about science, for instance, but then be a relativist about morality. I think sometimes um, what also draws people into moral relativism is just the that they have a real hard time actually shouldering their burden of proof to defend things as universal values. So if you try to do that and meet with a lot of skeptical resistance, then uh, relativism might look like what you're stuck with. Um, as we uh, explore these big theories in the next week or so, um, the utilitarianism, Kant's ethics, and, and virtue ethics, 
each of those philosophers is going to try to meet that challenge. They recognize that when they're making claims about what's objectively and universally correct or just or good, that they're saying something pretty big. Like that's a very ambitious thing to say. That this is these are the moral standards for everybody. No matter what culture you come from, no matter your background, your experience, what at wow. Like that's supposed to apply to you too. That's not a small thing to do. That's a huge ambition. You might even say it's an arrogant ambition. Um, but all those philosophers that we're going to take a look at, they know that. They're not dummies about this. They know what they're doing. And they recognize just how much of a burden of proof they're under to justify claims of that magnitude. And we'll see whether you think that their arguments are effective. Um, but this is one of the things that I think is cool about studying ethical theory is that something that might seem so impossible is maybe possible. I'm not going to say like definitely is. Um, take a look at them and kind of judge for yourself. But there's definitely some pretty solid attempts at it. Um, and I think you, you'll be able to see what um, makes those arguments at least appear compelling. Um, but So that'll, that'll be something we'll follow up on later. Um, um, but bottom line here, relativism is kind of just a non-starter. It makes truth-seeking just not uh, an option. And uh, that's what we're going to be doing this quarter. So there's going to be a kind of tacit assumption that relativism is false. If you have really strong relativist beliefs uh, or intuitions and you want to talk more about this, I would love to. I'd love to explore that in a very open, charitable kind of debate with you. Um, let me know if that's something that you're struggling with. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'd be happy to engage with you about that. Uh, I, I definitely you know, put my cards on the table. I don't think relativism is right. Um, I actually don't think realism is right either, weirdly enough. Um, I have uh, my, my presentation of the debate just now tonight was kind of a simplified version, and I'm going to pick up the more complicated version of it uh, probably uh, Tuesday uh, for the first lecture for next week. Um, because it'll have to do with Mill. There's, there's actually another option. You've got realism, you've got relativism, and then you have a position called subjectivism. And subjectivism believes truth is stance dependent, like moral truth is, is stance dependent, but they also believe in objective universal truth. So how that supports the work is kind of like a weird, it's a weird marriage um, of claims. The, the, re the relativist and the realist, you know, those two theses kind of go hand in hand a little bit. And it's sometimes hard to see how the subjectivist can have their cake and eat it too. Um, but uh, Mill's going to try to do that. Kant's going to try to do that. Um, subjectivism is really hard to describe with examples um, because trying to get those two claims to work with each other requires some fancy footwork. And But you'll see Kant and Mill actually attempt it in two totally different ways. Kant's going to dig really deep into the nature of reason, and Mill's going to dig really deep into the nature of our feelings and sentiments and our emotions. So we'll see very two diff very different approaches, but they're both going to be in this kind of subjectivist option. Personally, as a philosopher, I'm in the kind of subjectivist camp here too. Um, I believe in objective universal truth, um, but I am impressed with how the kind of truth we're talking about here is something that does depend on us in some way. So uh, more on that uh, next week. Um, how are we doing so far uh, with all this stuff about realism and relativism? I want to check in with with um, the people in the chat again. How, how have things gone? Any any questions? No one's really jumped in. Or there's been a couple moments of jumping in with questions, but is there anything else I can help to clarify or, or you're wondering about? Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Eye-opening eye in what sort of way? Yeah, 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 go ahead. I can hear you. Yeah. Oh. 
Oh. Yeah. Uh huh. It's giving you kind of a, a frame of reference for thinking about kind of these two different cultural worlds and what your opinions are about them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Totally I definitely think uh, if if anyone has experience like living in different cultures and different countries, um, this kind of philosophical territory about like realism or relativism, like what kind of approach, is maybe something you've already got a natural frame of reference for. You're like, what's the right way for me to think about this? Like, should when I'm in this context, is is that kind of right? And then when I'm in this context, that's right. Or do I, I kind of have my own opinion about what I think overall is right? That would be more like the realist sort of thing. Um, like this one's doing it wrong, this one's doing it right kind of thing. Um, but it, it can be sometimes hard to to uh, figure out like how you feel about this stuff and how you want to express your position and opinion about those experiences. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. So that actually was the thing I was going to raise as the possible concern. So, you know, just kind of trading one kind of uh, cultural commitment for another cultural commitment doesn't really change anything in terms of the footing about, um, you know, if we're thinking in realist terms about how do we justify or shoulder a burden of proof about what we think is truly right, right? Um, it's very possible. I, I've experienced this where... Uh, just spending some time in another culture, it starts to like rub off on you in ways that you're maybe not even paying attention about or endorsing, right? You start to pick it up. Um, and that I think that's where the, the sort of the next step of this discussion. Um, if we do think that there is objective universal moral truth, the next question is, how do we justify it? And it's probably not, well, okay, maybe I should tilt my hat for this one. This is a little bit of my personal philosophical views. Um, I don't. I'm kind of an anti-intuitionist. I don't trust our moral intuitions as holding a whole lot of water in making an argument to defend or rationally justify a moral position. I'm pretty suspicious of them. I'm worried about a lot of things like cultural bias. If, but here's the thing: like, if you were living in one culture, kind of like learned how to do things one way, and then you go to another culture, and then you're like, "Ooh, I'm rethinking some things," right? The question would be like. What is it about that new culture that's actually motivating the criticism? Because it might be that you just encounter the new culture and you're like, these people are so wrong because they're not doing things based on my old culture standards, right? So how does it make for one way or the other? Probably means there's something else going on. There's some other like implicit argument or considerations here that just the exposure to a different way of doing things showed uh, another possibility that... Now that you're entertaining it, you're like, oh, that makes sense. And it makes more sense than what I previously was believing or valuing. Does that sound about right, too? 
like you don't feel that you're just been brainwashed into American values, right? Yeah, thank you for sharing about that. Um, I I actually I think um, yeah I think this might show up some more in the future too. And the reason is that uh, even within America we've got at this point almost like there's two totally different cultures, and maybe more. I mean, but it, when it comes to a lot of stuff on the political spectrum, um, it's it's really getting like the two party system. It's like a two culture system. And it's really hard for the perspectives to talk to each other. Some of the philosophical underpinnings of that disagreement is going to be the main subject matter of this class. So the different, the two, there's kind of two really basic different visions of what social justice is. Um, I think I might have brought this up in the other intro video. Like, do you value well-being more, people's happiness, their quality of life in society, or do you care about their liberty, their freedoms? what they're allowed to do by the society. I mean, though, which of those two things to prioritize, the two kind of camps on that or the two different perspectives are, are having a harder and harder time engaging in productive dialogue with each other about that disagreement. Um, and we're going to touch on that in this class. So there might even be um, some cases of uh, discussion in the forums or maybe even in, in these little lecture things where we're going to see... Um, people coming at it from very, very different perspectives. Um, and almost like there's a whole different culture there, too. Um, and that's going to require a lot of charity, I think. I think this class will ask for a lot of charity, because the issues we're looking at are pretty controversial things. Um, and it's enough to even figure out, like, what are your reasons for your beliefs and intuitions, uh, much less to be able to sort out what are the possible reasons for a position that you think is bonkers or immoral. Right or unjust, so it, it'll be exciting. I'm looking forward to it, um, and and thinking about cultural diversity is is a pretty important part of this whole thing. Um, I actually, <laughs> it's an ironic sort of moment. Um, just last quarter or two quarters ago, with school administrative stuff, I applied for this class to satisfy the uh, cultural diversity uh, core requirement, and my approval got accepted. <laughs> it's like very much part and parcel of what we're going to be up to this quarter. Okay. Um, I also, or anything else people are wondering about or wanting to ask about here with the relativism realism thing? Cool, cool. We're, we're kind of coming up at the end here. Um, it's 10 o'clock. I think I'm going to keep the video going for maybe just a little bit longer. Uh, I kind of wanted to talk about egoism. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll just kind of talk about it for 10 minutes. I think I could do a 10-minute version of this. That'd be pretty pretty okay. Um, the, the egoism thing is kind of like the relativism thing in that it might be a deal breaker for us to even get started on this. Uh, and probably the best way for me to describe this is uh, um, some dinner parties I've gone to where I'm like meeting people and they're like, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I teach I teach philosophy. And I'm like, cool, what are you teaching? I'm like, well, I'm getting ready to, this, that, this actual conversation I had last quarter. Um, I'm getting geared up to, to teach business ethics and they're like, ho, 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 isn't that an oxymoron? So that kind of attitude, right? Like that business and morality are not, that's not a combo. Like the business world is a world of amorality. It's like a moral free zone. Uh, all the other aspects of life, meh, there's a morality involved there. But when it comes to the market, nah, it's just the jungle, the dog-eat-dog -dog world of the jungle. And uh, there aren't any moral considerations here. And that's a, that's a view that you'll see a lot. I've seen it a lot. Um, uh, this, you're, you're all in the accounting program, yes? Is that right? Yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, I've taught other versions of this class, 
um, that aren't just for the accounting students, but I get a lot of other like business majors and stuff like that. And sometimes they definitely walk into the door with this kind of attitude that it's like just free market capitalism, right? Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to be offended if you just try to destroy me in the marketplace. Cause that's what I'm trying to do to you. We're just in this competition for profit, right? And any kind of mercy or altruism is just, that's not what's going on. That's not the rules of the game. That's not what we're up to uh, in the market, in the world of business. Um, and that kind of perspective can sometimes just be limited to um, the business world. But I find oftentimes the reason why people sometimes think it's so permissible for it to happen in the business world is also because they kind of think it's happening in all of life. That the idea of, of life just being a jungle a dog-eat-dog -dog sort of thing where everyone's out out there for themselves, pursuing their own self-interest. But that's that's not just relegated to the markets. The markets are like a true reflection of how we actually are. And that all this talk about morality and altruism and virtue is just a bunch of bullshit. It's ways in which we sort of get our self-satisfaction or pursue our self-interest in, in ways that are kind of we're lying to ourselves about it. So when I when I like volunteer at the soup kitchen or I donate to a charity, I'm not doing something really altruistic. I'm actually doing something selfish. It makes me feel better about myself or something like that, right? There's all these kinds of cynical stories you might tell about how anything that anyone ever does is actually done from selfishness. And that's the position of psychological egoism. And in that egoism reading that I, uh, the sort of selections from this article uh, from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is online and one of the best sources for philosophy ever, uh, that's what it's talking about. Uh, psychological egoism is this sort of thesis that uh, all actions are motivated by self-interest. The ultimate object of all of your actions is the self, yourself, your own ego. Um, and this is a view that's been around for a long time, uh, all the way back to uh, Socrates and the ancient Greek philosophers, you've seen expressions of this. And actually, a lot of um, Plato's writings with Socrates are tackling this issue like really directly, because uh, there's a lot of sort of pseudo philosopher intellectual types who um, are not really interested in virtue and truth seeking and that these sort of more noble pursuits, but are really just interested in power. And uh, and doing it through the guise of being like a self-help help guru kind of thing or a teacher or something like that. They're called the sophists. Um, if you want to talk about that, that'd be, that's a fun tangent too. But I'm trying to keep this short. So um, there is this kind of view of psychological egoism. It's been around for a long time. That everything we do is ultimately uh, for selfish reasons. And so what? how does this kind of have anything to do with us and ethics? Well, the idea would be, the, the sort of the, the argument I could construct here is that if psychological egoism is true, if that's a true thing about us and about human nature, then the whole idea of holding ourselves to expectations of altruism, like moral values or moral principles, is just silly. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a fantasy. That's not what we are, and that's not what we could ever do. So to hold an expectation for that, to do something impossible, is just unreasonable. Um, it's not rational. And to the egoist, who also goes a little further and maybe endorses a view of ethical egoism, which is saying um, acting selfishly is not problematic, there's nothing morally wrong with selfishness, might even define rationality in terms of rational self-interest. Which, if you've taken um, economics classes, maybe you've taken some economics classes. Eh? Yep. So, like neoclassical economics and game theoretic models for the economy uh, all proceed on assumptions of principles of rational self interest. That what it is rational for a person to do is what promotes their interests in a maximal sort of way. Um, there are some economists these days who challenge those theoretical assumptions of neoclassical economics, of capitalist economics, um, and put other principles in their place, but um, that is an option that's out there. And a lot of people are thinking in those terms when they're approaching the world of business and the possibility of there being ethical obligations in it or something like that. Um, this is a theme we'll see show up repeatedly. 
throughout the class as well. Um, but I wanted to just say a couple things about it right at the outset. One, to just like identify it, define it, put it on your radar. Um, but also, if you if you go on and read that little Stanford article uh, excerpt, um, you'll see a kind of uh, like the uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Let me back up a little bit. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is a peer-reviewed uh, source, um, sort of written by professional philosophers for professional philosophers. Um, and its main use is, it's kind of like what we normally use Wikipedia for, like, oh, what's been going on with this? Or what's the history of this topic or debate? Um, but it also tries to sort of tell you where's the state of the field right now. So the articles are not supposed to be strongly opinionated. Um, they're, they're not about someone making a philosophical argument for a position, but they're sort of trying to bring you up to speed on what's going on in the field. And certainly that article reports, and it's it's definitely true in my experience too as a, as a professional philosopher, that most people are pretty down on psychological egoism right now. Like the idea that the thesis is actually true seems really far-fetched. Um, even though you find this idea a lot, and people, I think, have some in intuitions about it, this kind of cynical view that everyone deep down is totally selfish, um, and they and it's impossible to be otherwise. Um, it's a when you when you step back and think about it, that's a pretty strong claim to make about human psychology and what we're capable of valuing, especially because we can conceptualize valuing things that are not ourselves. So to sort of Pr uh, predict that if we really dig down into the subconscious, every time we did something for a motive that seems altruistic, it's deeply selfish, is sort of very difficult to maintain. A lot of the stories, the kind of uh, theoretical hypotheses that the egoist can offer to support their case, um, upon sort of critical inspection, seem pretty hard to, uh, to really sustain against objections. So I, I kind of wanted to report on that. I think that's an interesting result that most philosophers kind of have, have a consensus here that uh, psychological egoism is not probably going to be able to defend itself. It's a very, very difficult position to maintain. It's definitely not the default option. It's definitely not the most intuitive, straightforward proposal. It's really the weirdo on, in the discussion, um, and it has a lot of burden of proof to shoulder to prove itself. Um, one big reason why this is true, and, and then I promise we'll, stop, we'll call this very long video to an end. Um, so thanks for sticking around. I'm, I'm actually impressed. Thank you for being here the whole time. It's almost 10 o'clock. And for, for one of you, it's almost midnight um, in your time zone. Um, I'm just going to offer this one last idea. Um, one big thing that makes psychological egoism potentially more persuasive or intuitive than it actually is, is a potential equivocation or confusion we could make between two different things. It's a fact, a trivial fact, that if I'm going to do any action, the only motivations that can get me to act are the motivations that I have. So any action Tim Lineman performs is going to be motivated by motives that Tim Lineman possesses. That's a trivial fact. That's absolutely true. We don't act on each other's motives. It's not like we're a part of some kind of telepathic hive mind where you feel something and I act on it. I mean, maybe that's true. I've actually, there's some people, some of my friends believe that that's true. They're kind of into some spiritual stuff. I'm not, I don't think we have a lot, I, I'm kind of agnostic about those forces, whether anything like that is going on, but um, definitely that doesn't seem to be what's going on. Um, we act on, and I, so we can kind of grant for the sake of argument, fair enough, yeah. We only act on motives that are ours. What that doesn't mean, though, is that basic fact doesn't mean that the object of concern for all of my actions and all of my, my, all my motives is actually myself. So, uh, for example, if I sincerely care about say my students. So I decide, you know what, I'm going to hold a special study session for my critical reasoning students prior to their first exam. I don't have to do it. Uh, I'm going to do it. Um, and my motive is that I know that it would be good for them. And I value that. So the only way I'm going to act on that value is if it's actually mine. 
but in the content of that value, I'm not really showing up, not explicitly. It's what's it's my judgment of what is good for my students, what's going to help them succeed. That is the thing that I'm concerned about. That's the object of concern. It's my focus. It's my end goal for why I'm doing the action that I'm thinking about doing. If the, the egoist wants to argue that that is in fact selfish, with what's been said so far, the fact that it's my motive doesn't mean that it is selfish. The distinction between selfishness and altruism is not about acting on motives that are mine versus acting on motives that are in other people's psyches. It's a matter of what's the object of concern. And that's why what the psychological egoist is going to have to claim is something like, oh, well, the only reason you care about your students or treat them as an object of value is because maybe it makes you feel more successful or like your power as a teacher, you like having respect or influence, uh, or you like you have this like identity of being a good person that you need to maintain. You need to like see yourself as a servant or blah 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 blah, right? All these kinds of uh, cynical interpretations of there being a hidden a hidden selfish motive, a hidden motive behind the explicit motive, the direct motive that is somehow involving the self that has the self as a part of the content. So if, if we pull those things apart, if we pull apart the content of the objects of concern from just the bare trivial fact that anything, any motives I'm going to act on have to be mine, then I think it, it, we see that psychological egoism is maybe not as intuitive as it might seem. I, I think a lot of the force of why uh, this kind of position might seem obvious to people is because of the obviousness of the trivial fact that I can only act on motives that are in fact mine. But that doesn't mean that I'm the object of concern. That's the point. So I wanted to offer that. I think that's a, that's a useful observation in thinking about uh, psychological egoism. I think it is very psychologically possible for us to be concerned about something more than ourselves. But the real question is, should we? And on what grounds? And that's what we're going to find, and in what way, too, that's another question. That's what we're going to explore next in the class as we look at some of these classical ethical theories. And, and my main concern here, going forward, just so you know, um, a big thing that I'm tracking, and I, I want you to be tracking too, especially if you're doing some of the optional readings and kind of following along or looking at my lecture notes, I'm very concerned with um, you understanding not just what these theories are saying is what's morally right, but my most important concern is if you understand why they think that that is the correct answer. So when we do Mill on Tuesday, why does Mill think utilitarianism is justifiably the correct moral theory to have? Um, what, what is he grounding it on? What is he justifying it on? That's the thing that I really want you to understand because... Um, you know, a bunch more other ethical theories or perspectives, there are a dime a dozen. There's ethical perspectives everyone. Everyone's got a different idea of ethics. Um, it's not hard to find other alternative points of view. The thing that's really something we can sink our teeth into is trying to navigate that diversity in some critical way. Like, what would count as an argument in favor of one thing versus another? So understanding the whys is going to be really important, especially when we're thinking about how to kind of come to conclusions about these other matters in the world of business. Um, there's some different strategies for how to do this. So I, I want you to be especially tracking the why. Make sure that you're not just understanding the what, but also the why. When I lecture on Tuesday on, on utilitarianism, I'll actually do it in two parts. And we'll start with the what, but then we'll shift to the why. Um, and I'll attack them kind of in a two-step fashion. So that's what we'll be doing. Um, anything else from the, the chat room here before we close up shop for the night? Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. Why do I always do this? The code. Yes. I forgot about the code. Um, let's do... Um, the secret code for this video will be... Um, mm, uh, how about tennis? I've got tennis balls over there. They're my kid's favorite toy right now. So tennis, or tennis balls, whatever you want. Yeah. Tennis, the, like the sport. Yeah. 
So thank you for helping me remember that. Actually, uh, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I might need reminders in the future. So if you're ever around in a future video, uh, I would definitely appreciate it. Thank you. Sorry to those YouTubers who are getting nervous about it. Um, there's the tennis is the code. All right. <laughs> I guess just get too wrapped up in everything else. So anything else you want to ask or talk about? Nope. You're welcome. Cool. And just as a reminder to everyone, um, I think I was saying this at the beginning of the video, but why not close with it too? Um, if you ever want to talk outside of class, outside of class, uh, call me up and send me text messages, emails. I'm always down for all that. Phone calls are my favorite, and I'm very available uh, during the mid part of the day, every day of the week, but especially on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'm hanging out at Bellevue College with not usually a lot to do from 10.30 to 2.30. The gap between my classes is really annoying. Um, I'm usually doing other stuff, but that's a great time to get a hold of me. Those are my official office hours, and for our purposes, my office is the phone line, so it's a virtual office. Um, I'm sorry, I missed that message. Uh, thanks for the flexibility. Cool lesson. Awesome. I'm happy you enjoyed it. Oh, it's snowing in Chicago. Oh, boy. Yeah, it hasn't quite decided to become spring here yet either. I hope that happens. But anyway, I'll uh, I'll bid you adieu and have a good night, everyone, and I'll stop the video.